when I see this in Melbourne, that's when I think it's going to take off. Perth is clearly winning, but the race isn't over. This data doesn't exist anywhere else. Really? Ooh, this I got a see. Mike Mortlock, property investor and co-founder of MCG Quantity Surveying, shares never-before-seen data to help us understand the contrast between the Perth and Melbourne property markets in 2024. What we found is actually a 17.8% drop in investor activity during that period. Before the boom, 9% of investors, according to our data, were buying into WA. Now, that's actually 39.9% of investors the political side of things around investment, you can really see that that has really taken the heat out of Victoria. Mike and I chat through the current state of both property markets, giving you a mixture of analytical and anecdotal insights. You do the rough numbers on that and you're gonna to get to a figure of around about $2.3 trillion. This is the biggest difference between Perth and Melbourne. If you've been thinking of investing in the Perth or Melbourne property market, you're going to enjoy this episode. My name's Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast, and you're listening to my chat with Mike Mortlock about the Perth and Melbourne property markets. Mike Mortlock, how you going? I'm doing well. I'm excited to chat to you on this one. Mate, this is a big topic, mm. and, and I'm looking forward to unpacking this because you've got some data that I don't even think has seen the light of day before, which is really interesting. Mm. But also, I think it's just something that is being talked about quite a lot, and to actually be able to start unpacking this from a data point of view, an anecdotal point of view, a political point of view, mm. we're looking at this from a few different angles, mate. So, But before we get into everything, Perth versus Melbourne, mm. is there anything you want to kind of set the stage with? Well, Perth's winning, obviously. Well, yeah. <laughs> it goes without saying, right? But I think what's interesting about Perth and Melbourne right now is we're considering, okay, well, Perth has had such a run, right? And it's if it's not the peak of the market, it has to come eventually. Look, who knows? It's crystal ball. It could do another 12, 24 months. It might even do more. There's some arguments to say that it's running more on kind of hype and sentiment rather than fundamentals. But on the other side of the spectrum, you've got Mel Melbourne, which is the perennial poor performer. But there's some key similarities and some very key differences, both in data and in politics, certainly. And for anyone that's been following the market closely, like you just said, Perth is clearly winning. But the race isn't over. And the big thing about this is that there is no finish line. Mm. One day, whether it's, it's, it's six months, two months, two years, however long, eventually when Perth starts cooling down, it's not going to be the last time that Perth heats up again. No. And this is the whole thing with property. It's not so much about where, it's about where and when. Yes. These two need to coincide. Like Darwin always gets uh, the rough end of the stick whenever we're talking about property in this country. Mm. And it depends on where you live. A lot of people can see why. One day, though, I guarantee it, I don't think it's going to be for a while, we'll be talking about Darwin as the next hotspot. I, I just don't think it's going to be anytime soon, which is why it's never in any headlines. The one that I do believe is potentially a big sleeping giant, though, is Melbourne. Mm. I think it doesn't make any sense right now. Mm. And I wanted to unpack this from the data perspective with you, from what you've got looking back from, was it 2021, 22, 23? Can you start unpacking a little bit of this so we can start understanding the story of Perth and Melbourne side by side over the past few years? Mm. Well, I always kind of remember in terms of median house prices, Sydney, Melbourne, and then it's kind of the rest after that. Melbourne mm -hmm. was always underneath Sydney, but it was comfortably in second position. That's mm -hmm. not the case anymore. Now, of course, medians are flawed and it depends on the makeup of houses and units, but Melbourne has been overtaken by Brisbane, right? And Perth, you go back to 2021, it was the second lowest median mm -hmm. after Darwin, which we just talked about. You know, Darwin is, is so sketchy that it makes kind of like Perth's resource exposure look, you know, blue chip. Yeah. But, you know, that has definitely changed. And I think 2022, 2023, in our data, we can see if we were to summarise where investors went, it was all about affordability. And you can see that now. The three top performing markets are Brisbane, Adelaide and WA, and they are some of the cheapest. Of course, we have Hobart in the doldrums, but it's kind of had its run. Do you say in the doldrums? In the doldrums, yes. That's, that sounds like a very dark and dank place for Hobart to be. It is It is a little bit sad. But, I mean, like Hobart was was the golden-haired boy for a, a, quite a period of time. It's like six years or something, wasn't yeah, it? It just yeah. kept going. Had a really solid run. You know, yeah. it kind of, I think it sort of started pre-pandemic, that kind of put it on ice for a minute, and then it just went absolutely crazy. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful part of the world. 
Mm, went there for the first time not long ago. Did you? Yeah, I did realise you need a car though. Hobart was nice, but it's really the rest of Tassie that that's that's where it starts kicking into high gear. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah, I remember getting a speeding ticket in Tasmania and it cost me 70 something dollars and I was delighted. <laughs> so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so looking back then, we're talking about Perth being one of the most affordable places in the country, Melbourne mm. being the second most unaffordable places, mm. and this is 2021, Doug? Yeah, yeah. And, and so you go back to the percentage of people buying in WA, we kind of saw, before the boom, we saw it kind of peak at around about 9% of investors, according to our data, were buying into WA. Now that has galloped along in the last little while. We sort of probably saw it starting to take off in the back end of 2022 to the point where it's the number one location of any state in Australia for investors right now. And what percentage is that when you say it's the number one? So in terms of 2024, it's actually 39.9% of investors buying in WA as distinct from every other state. So is that like tripled, quadrupled? Like we're talking huge. Increase. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it got into the 30s in 2022, but uh -huh. before that, you know, 16% roughly in 2021, and it's just been absolutely galloping away. And what is that looking like in contrast to Victoria? Comparing WA to Victoria, traditionally it would sit around the sort of 14 to 16% over the long-term average. I mean, we've been collecting this data for a number of years. So in the preceding two years prior to the land tax changes, and that was a big one for Victoria, it was 9.4%. And we've got some new data that compared that 9.4%, which was already quite subdued to what actually happened after those land tax changes were legislated. What happened then? Well, we actually saw it drop to 5.7%, which ostensibly is a 39.9% .9 drop in investors buying in Victoria. So for anyone that's on iTunes or Spotify listening right now, I know this is a few numbers to actually consume, but stay with us because th this is, yeah, this is opening up something quite important. And if you're listening, if you're watching on, on YouTube, then I'm sure we've got something on the screen to make this a little bit easier to follow. But You'd hope so. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> but can you tell me a little bit more about, you said like our data. So you've mm. actually collected this at MCG. This isn't stuff from ABS or anything, is it? No, no, this data doesn't exist anywhere else. So of course, when we do a tax depreciation schedule, we say, what did you buy? Where did you buy it, right? Uh -huh. So we know where investors are buying and where they're buying it, New South Wales versus Victoria versus WA. And that's how we've been able to track the rise of WA. So this is not a prediction. This is not an ABS thing. This is what investors are actually doing, where they're voting is where they're buying. And mm -hmm. that that is the increase. So, you know, rounding in round figures, prior to the land tax changes, we had about 9.7% of people buying in Victoria. And essentially it's dropped by 40% since that announcement. That's so big. Mm. And and so we've got less people buying in Victoria, mm. more people buying in Perth. So as far as Perth versus Melbourne, like we're saying, Perth is clearly ahead now. Yeah. But what are the next few years really looking like? That's mm. the big question I think on everyone's lips. Yes. But one of the things you and I were talking about off air, and I've had this conversation with a few people as well in the investor space, is it's not all in like just the, the hard data of what's happening in, in Melbourne and Perth and specifically Melbourne. It's the political side that I find really interesting to open up. Yeah. But before we get into it, is there anything else sort of numbers wise you wanted to really make sure the stage was was set with for Melbourne and Perth? I think that's a good start. But yeah, the political side of things or, or the state policy in and around investment, mm -hmm. we, you can really see in the data that that has really taken the heat out of Victoria. It was already sort of trending downwards because, you know, it was quite expensive comparable to other places and with interest rates, you know, rising as rapidly as they did, you know, our data is saying the average amount people were spending on a property is $650,000. You know, you couldn't go to Melbourne and do that. You could go to WA and buy in Perth in 21, 22. So it's affordability. Absolutely. Okay, but the affordability is not really there anymore because now in 2024, what's the latest data you've got there for median house price for Perth, median house price for Melbourne? So in 2024, it's 736,000 in Perth yeah. and 784 in Melbourne. So it's very, very close. So as far as difference is concerned now, there's not really much in it. No, but as you referenced before, 
the political state of play and the legislation in and around and even the sentiment in and around investment mm. couldn't be more different. And this is what I want to talk to you. And without really like opening this up in a Labour liberal who you vote for, like, I don't, I don't care. This is purely through the lens of what is actually investor friendly and what's not investor friendly and what's potentially like, I guess, keeping Melbourne kind of tamed at the moment for mm. lack of a better term. Yeah. Airbnb tax. Yeah. This was one of the first on the list. Mm. What WA was giving investors money whilst Victoria was taxing investors money. Could you open up the more of the detail behind that contrast? It's the same it's the same issue, right? Like they want the Airbnb stuff to be long-term rental because we're in a national rental crisis, mm -hmm. right? With vacancy rates across the country at you know one point one, one point two percent, whatever it is, some under one percent. Yeah, absolutely. And and Perth, you know, it's like point six percent. So it's the same problem. Like Airbnb does not solve the problem of putting a roof over tenants' heads, but two very different approaches. In WA, here's an incentive. Here's ten thousand dollars to take your short-term property and putting it on the long-term market. Victoria, here's a 7.5% tax on Airbnb. So it's kind of like they're both trying to do the same thing, but one's whacking you with a stick, the other one's dangling a carrot. And as far as which one's more effective, because mm. I feel like right now there'll be some people heading over to the comments section in YouTube, mm. giving their Lesson. two cents and, and their thoughts on what's more effective. Can you open up a little bit about the the tax side of things? When we, wow, what was it, 2022? Um, Palaszczuk thought, oh, I've got a good idea mm. one morning. Yeah. I'm going to change land tax around for Queensland. Yeah. You got some data on that to really illustrate how this can actually affect a market change. This isn't just a sentimental, oh, okay, well, we think it's bad because we're investors and we don't like it. Yes. Can you open up a little bit of that change? Yeah, we've already shared the data on Victoria and what happened, you know, rounded up 40% reduction in investor activity mm -hmm. because of those land tax changes. Now, Queensland's a little bit different because that land tax was thankfully repealed through the great work done at PIPA and REIQ. But there was a 98 day period we calculated where people could invest in Queensland with the full knowledge that they would be impacted by these legislated changes. Of course, they were repealed, but they were law. So what we found is actually a 17.8% drop in investor activity during that period. So 17.8%, What when you say investor activity, it's like less people purchasing? Yes, yeah. Well, they would actually purchase in other states. So Queensland lost investment to other states like WA. That's insane. Mm. So it doesn't actually help. That means essentially we're, we're losing rentals during a rental crisis. Yeah, well, it do, I mean, it comes down to what was the aim. If the aim was to make the rental crisis better or do something to solve it, it made it worse. If the aim was to generate income revenue... Would have done that well. ...for the state, it, it, mm. it would have been fantastic for mm. that. What I think a lot of people have forgotten is that Pal the Palaszczuk government said um, when they repealed it that we haven't repealed it because we think it's a bad idea. We've repealed it because the other states wouldn't play ball and give us the data. It's a bad idea. Like well, it is a bad <laughs> idea. I mean, I think that's categorical <laughs> proof, especially if you're trying to increase the supply of rental properties. And, you know, it's not like Queensland had a 4% vacancy rate, you know, Queensland was mm. in a dire situation as well. And what happened? We saw less people wanting to buy in Queensland. And on the other side, where that's not data that we have, PropTrack were crunching the numbers, but a lot of people were selling their Queensland properties. Mm. So not only no one's coming in, well, less people are coming in, and there's people going out the back door as well. So it that legislation made it harder to be a renter in Queensland categorically. And when some people use the argument saying, yeah, but it would be one for one though, because then people might sell and investors would sell, but that means that a first home buyer will buy it. And that mm. first home buyer might be someone that's then out of the renter pool. So yeah. then it's one for one. I, I'm not convinced it's that simple. No. And, and I just feel that sometimes that's something that on paper, I get it, that kind of makes sense. Mm. But if you think about it, a lot of first home buyers now are probably still living at home with mum and dad. They're potentially in a share house at the moment. Mm. So they've gone from an occupancy rate of maybe four or five in a house to then getting into their own property. So it hasn't really gone one for one. Mm. So it's it's potentially just going to put more stress on the rental market as well. Mm. But as far as the land tax changes and the, the carrot and stick theme just continues, 
Can we talk a little bit about the, the actual changes in land tax for mm. both states? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's the vacancy tax, which we haven't touched on as well. So Victoria initiated that 1% vacancy tax. So if you have a property that's vacant for six months or more, you're paying annually 1% of its value. WA doesn't have that. So that's just another example where they're putting this kind of impost on renters rather than trying to stimulate the supply. Because I think we can all agree, we talk about supply, 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 and people just kind of think, well, that means new building. But you know, th we've got to ensure that that building goes into the rental pool, right? The mm. easiest way to increase rental supply is to help the people that are providing 91% of rental accommodation. Is it 91? It's roughly 91%, yeah. What we used to call mum and dad investors, but, you know, that term sort of is a little bit out of date I think now. that it's now referred to as greedy landlord. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was actually thinking of getting shirts made up that just said greedy landlord. That'll make you very popular yeah. in the YouTube comments. I'll just walk down the street with that, <laughs> get some like rubbish thrown at me. Yes. <laughs> anyway, it's a bit of a difference from be kind. Um, but so as far as tax changes are concerned, that's still just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. We're, we're also talking about the the land tax changes for investors. Mm. What is it? It's uh, $50,000? Yeah, the threshold. The threshold? Yeah. I don't know how about you, but I've got so many $49,000 parcels of land in Victoria. Oh, heaps, I've yeah. just snuck right under. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my point. It may as well be like $0. Mm, it's, yeah. it's almost like they're having a laugh. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's another difference that has changed in recent years. That's mm. not something that Victoria's had for the past 20 years and just haven't updated it. No, but there's, there's a fair argument to say that, you know, the interest bill for Victoria is massive. It's a state that is in a lot of trouble economically. And these land tax changes are predicted to double the land tax revenue in 25, 26. You know, that's a significant take. And I think, you know, when you're trying to raise revenue, whether it be state or federal, politicians always kind of think, well, all right, well, we need money, but like who is the most p politically popular person to pick on? It's probably property investors because when we know from the debates that we had uh, with uh, the negative gearing elections, remember those two elections where Labor were saying mm -hmm. we're going to abolish negative gearing? I remember that. That was quite politically popular. But, you know, the, the problem is investors are providing that rental accommodation. We scare them off and we can see what happens. We see them exiting and we see investors not wanting to transact at all or in that state. And most investors like to invest for a long time horizon, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. But fiddling around at the margins just removes that certainty. And I've said it before that we can have a debate about whether we think residential property should be an asset class that you can invest in, right? We can have that argument, but what we can't do is take investors out of the pool when they are doing the vast majority of the heavy lifting of providing that rental accommodation. And you can go back 50 years, a third of people rent fairly consistently. But more to your point here, Mike, and, and I, I feel like this is on it. Otherwise, yeah, maybe not. But the video we did with um, Cam Murray recently, mm. an economist, um, got a lot of mixed reviews in the comments. Mm. One comment actually stood out to me, and what you're saying now, I think this really applies. This is from the two-wheeled introvert. Curious to test my thinking here. The Greens seem a bit upset about the tax deduction for landlords, but aren't these tax deductions simply a rental subsidy by another name? Using round figures, let's say landlords get a tax refund of $20 billion excluding deductions on capital gains tax. To get that 20 billion, landlords had to lose 60 billion. That 40 billion gap between the losses and the tax refund, that was for the benefit of the renter. Mm. That seems like a win for the taxpayer as they don't need to spend 40 billion into social housing, a win for the renter, and maybe over time, the landlord gets the capital gain. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is forgotten out of the equation a lot of the time? I haven't read the other comments, but I'm going to say that wins because that is actually a very intelligent thought experiment. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know where he got that $20 billion, but if you look at the long-term average of, say, rental losses or negative gearing losses, excluding, say, last year, on average, it's about $3.6 billion a year. Now, what is not in the media is in 2021, which is the latest ATO stats that we have because they're always delayed. Mm -hmm. There's actually no 
net negative gearing losses because we're at sort of emergency level interest rates, right? Of course, it was hard to negatively gear property was, a few years ago. It was very difficult. You probably, you know, bathed in the glory <laughs> of your positively <laughs> geared property in a lovely way that you're That's not it. doing to the same extent now. Mm -hmm. But think of that $3.6 billion. Now, yep. is it a good deal for the taxpayer to have 91% roughly of rental accommodation provided at a cost of $3.6 billion? Now, Take, for example, let's say it costs $700,000 for a house on a block of land, you know, as a rough national average median. Okay. Some places going to be a bit less, some places a bit more, but that's probably about right. Po possibly even a bit conservative. Yeah. But yeah okay. Let's well, go with it. For round numbers, 700K. Yep. You multiply that across the roughly 11 million dwellings we have in Australia, and yep. then you times it by, let's say, 30% of properties are rentals. You do the rough numbers on that, and you're going to get to a figure of around about $2.3 trillion, not $3.6 billion, $2.3 trillion. Now that is an extraordinary amount of money that the government simply can't afford to invest in providing that rental accommodation that private landlords are doing right now. Have you ever seen that meme of a million versus a billion versus a trillion? No. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, I highly recommend that you uh, just quickly search this. But if you're watching on YouTube, um, we'll, we'll cut to a shot of this properly. But a million dollars is is this. A uh, hundred million looks like this. A billion, it looks like this. A trillion. <laughs> it's, wow. It's just an inconceivable kind of number. Mm. And we're talking about this. And I, and I use this purposely to put it in perspective because... To think about a three billion dollar like amount that taxpayers are going, oh, well, we're we're not getting that. That sounds ridiculous. It's mm. huge. Yeah. But to put it in perspective of a okay, well, the other option is to spend. Would you say two point four trillion? Trillion, roughly. I mean, let's say I've got the numbers a little bit wrong. Like it's how half it? How wrong could they be? And it's still not being a better deal. That's where I say, like, we can have the debate about whether private investors should provide ruse over people's head and it be an asset class that we can invest in. But how can the government really meaningfully replace it? And we know over the last 10 years, roughly their ownership of, of, of rental properties is around about $330,000, not 0.3 of 11 million. Mm. So bringing this back to Perth versus Melbourne. That's what this was about, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> We're not baking a cake anymore. No. <laughs> What like what I'm basically hearing is when the political landscape starts becoming a little less because it's not even about being investor friendly. It's about not sort of beating on investors, not mm. not using the stick on investors. It's like you don't even have to pull the carrot out; just put the stick away. Mm. And and if that starts to really shine, right now, as far as affordability is concerned, Melbourne's looking like it's got some affordability there. Mm. The yield is still not massively strong. But there's also a lot of pressure on that rental market. Yes. And it wouldn't surprise me if that starts growing a little bit more because as far as the affordability for rents compared to some of the other states, mm. there's even places like property we've got in South Australia that is more to rent in very blue-collar areas than it would be in similar blue-collar areas in Melbourne. Mm. That price pressure is only going to go in one direction for Melbourne, which is only going to help the yield even more, especially if the prices don't grow for that little bit longer. So what I'm kind of hearing from you, Mike, is – Really pay attention to the politics of Melbourne if you're really wanting to think, okay, if is, is now the time to jump on? Because Perth did nothing for what was it, like 10 years? It was well, longer than 10 years. Yeah, 14 years. The well, median house price went from like 493 to 490 over that period. It did sort of go up, but ostensibly nothing for 14 years. And so I think the concern for some investors would be like, well, is Melbourne just going to sleep mm. for a long time? Mm. How, how do we actually know? And I think one of the things to look for is the political landscape. Yes. Where? Two things I want to pick up on that, and I'll mm -hmm. try and remember them because I'll probably get lost after the first one. The first one was that in October last year, 2023, at the Melbourne Pippa breakfast, we had actually had the shadow Victorian housing men member in attendance, and he asked a panel. So on stage we had Terry Wright, we had Stuart Weems, we had Kate Bakos, and he stood up and he said, what do you think Victoria needs to do to incentivise investors? And their consensus answer was, investors don't need incentives. They just need the disincentives removed. And they'll, they will do what they do, right? Exactly. Don't worry about the carrot, just get rid of the stick. Yeah. The other thing is, if you think about 
uh, population growth, and you know, we know that population is overstated as a predictor of price movements and those sorts of things. But what we do know is, in the twelve months to September twenty twenty three, Australia grew by two point five percent. In first place was WA. In second place was Victoria at two point eight percent. So the state is growing. It's basically net zero for interstate migration. So people aren't leaving like they are New South Wales, and you know, certainly they're going to WA or WA is getting interstate migration. Mm. Queensland's probably winning that race. But we've got 2.5% population growth. And what we actually did is we ran a research project where we looked at a 29-day period, so mid-April to mid-May, and we calculated the number of ex-rental properties for sale. And in broad terms, there was around about an annualised figure of 45,000 rental properties for sale. Now, you contrast that with ABS lending figures, and there's about 40,000 people looking, well, you know, buying properties in the state. So that's a net rental loss of 5,000 rental properties or 1%. But a 1% decrease in the rental stock is significant when the population is growing by 2.5%, whereas all other states were seeing a net increase in rental properties. So it's turning up the heat of Victoria. I've never claimed to be a data expert. I, I enjoy it. I get into it. But it's definitely not like the hard and fast lane that I run down but to me, that sounds pretty obvious on price pressure. Mm. Like, h how is it not going to, to feel that as far as rents are concerned? Mm. And, and that's the thing. Like, if, if policymakers are trying to make it easier for renters, the decisions that they made in Queensland, we can see were net negative. Mm. The decisions that they've made in Victoria, our data is telling us that they're twice as damaging as the Queensland land tax because in Victoria, it's not just the land tax, it's the minimum standards legislation, it's the vacancy tax, it's things like the Airbnb tax, it's some of the, the tenancy changes in and around you know how you can evict people, uh, all sorts of different things around that. And that is a real contrast between WA, carrot and stick. And WA hasn't exactly incentivised investors to come in. They just haven't disincentivised them like the like the advice to the, the shadow Victorian housing minister was. So Mike, I feel like we've painted the picture pretty detailed. Like this is like an upside down Mr. Squiggle Van Gogh that we're about to turn back around the other way. Mm. And what everyone wants to know is really is, is Perth just going to keep going and that's where they should be running to and Melbourne's going to keep sleeping for a few years? Or is it maybe Perth's time to, to start cooling down a little bit mm. and it's Melbourne that's really the, the place that people should be planning their money? And whilst we, we never give financial advice, this is not financial advice, please seek independent professional financial advice. I, I say that so quickly now. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I've said You've it a said few it times. Yeah. It's, it's something that I want to open up a little bit more for the way that we can like start wrapping this up because it's something that I guess that's that's the real crux of this whole thing, Perth versus Melbourne. So I guess it begs the question, when is the door likely to be closing on Perth and when is it looking like it's really going to be opening on Melbourne? Mm. I could like really have egg in my face in alignment by picking the peak of the Perth property market and getting it ridiculously wrong. I'm not about to do that. I mean, there's, there's cleverer people than me, like Terry Ryder, who said back in October that the Perth fundamentals aren't right for him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's done 2% last month and two percent the month before mm -hmm. you know on an annualized basis i'm not a mass genius but we're talking 24 percent growth that's the trend i i think the argument is like perth is a market that we know has had long periods of of no growth so when it reaches the peak and there has to be a peak like the median can't go to 10 million dollars can it I mean, imagine if I was wrong on that and people replay that. Look at this guy. He didn't think it would be 10 million <laughs> and it was. I mean, it's very unlikely, right? Very, That'd be, yeah. The odds on that would be good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the, the question is Melbourne, it, ha it has some – fundamentals and there has to be some fundamentals and eventually there will be some green shoots and I always contend that if you wait for the green shoots then you're minimizing your upside so if the market grows by 20 percent over the cycle and you wait until the data is telling you that it's growing the data's lag you're minimizing your upside and I think all investors should invest 
counter cyclically. Yes, it's great to time the market, but we know time in the market is important. Mm -hmm. But yeah, be, being bold and going, look, this is the opportunity to buy when there's no competition. Whereas in Perth, it's so competitive. And mm. if you look at the listings data, that paints a very interesting story about the differences between Perth and Victoria. And in this show, we're not really saying, should I buy in Perth or should I buy in Melbourne? We're just kind of showing the complete opposite sides of the cycle. And mm. that data, I think when that starts to flip, that's when Melbourne is really going to be having those green shoots and getting off to the races. And what does it look like now? Well, Funny you should ask. Here's something I prepared <laughs> earlier. This is the listings data from SQM uh, Research, and this was to May 2023, inclusive of May 2024, I should say. Okay. A yearly listing change for Melbourne is up 27.3%. Up? Up, yeah. Okay, so a, a, over a quarter more stock on the market. It's mm, yeah. huge. It's a lot. Whereas Perth, down 23.4%. Complete contrast. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, we see that now, right? We can see that in the fact that Melbourne, I think, has done 0.1% over the last 12 months mm -hmm. compared to Perth, which has been absolutely bananas. You look at the new listings data in Melbourne, percentage yearly change, that's new listings less than 30 days, 41.5% increase. Perth, only a 6% increase. And one thing that I think is also a really cautionary tale is the old listing. So listings greater than 180 days. You look at Melbourne, there's 0.1% of listings, whereas Perth, oh, that's a percentage change, whereas Perth, it's negative 56.7%. And I've heard people say in the past that when that figure is, is such as it is, it means that the properties that typically in a balanced market are undesirable. It's those main road properties. It's the ones that just, you know, the the ugly duckling. Mm -hmm. I mean, that decrease in, in those age listings is saying that the market is so hot, people are scrambling over the scraps. It's a good time to actually sell a regretful purchase in a booming market, just in case anyone is holding some kind of main road rubbish that they couldn't sell in a normal mm. market. Oh, I, I can't think of a better time in Perth in the last kind of 15 or 20 years to sell something that you kind of think is, is going to, you know, it's not something that you want to hold on to the long term because of maintenance or issues or what have you. Yeah. So what I'm really hearing here is Melbourne is everything about it right now is unattractive for investors. Mm. Mm. It's all pointing towards the market is not strong. Mm. But this to me really says it depends on how much people put stock in the old Warren Buffett quote of mm. be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Mm. And if anyone's been listening to the show for a little while, you know that I say that on so many episodes and I actually, actually think it's wording in one of the ads that we've got that we play. Like, But it's, I think... It's something really to consider mm. because when everyone's running towards it, sometimes it's it's a, a good sign to start walking backwards slowly because when the masses are doing it, generally it's it's done. Yeah, and didn't he also say that when the tide goes out, we find out who's swimming naked? So I think the argument is that if you're in WA, get your gear off because the tide's coming in. <laughs> That is not, uh, that is not uh, personal <laughs> advice. You may get arrested by the constabulary. You're a fighting man? Uh, I mean, you can sort of look at my face and work backwards <laughs> and answer that for yourself. I mean, I once once punched a uh, young gentleman in the stomach. It sounds like I did it as an adult a, when a I was a gentleman. kid. You're like beating up kids, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to fight, see? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not either. But I, I just can't help but think of like some kind of comparison that I might be completely messing up here. Mm. But I'm thinking like Conor McGregor, he was like the greatest fighter or like a, a huge fighter, right? Mm. Everyone loved the guy. Mm. And he, he got beaten. I've just Googled it here. So I could be completely wrong on this, but Michael Chandler, from yeah. what I understand. He him. sort of kicked him in the leg and it snapped and that was game over. But he got yeah. beat by that Russian fella as well, choked him out. And he said like... You know, now we talk because he was very vocal in the press conferences and the Russian guy was like nothing and he's beating him going, now we talk. Now, now we talk. Now it's we like, talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are you, you obviously know more about this than I do. 
my point in saying this though is is just because someone's on top for a while doesn't mean they can't be knocked down but just because mm. someone gets knocked down doesn't mean they can't get back up mm. it's the same for property markets mm. just because perth right now is clearly on top mm. and this is what i feel this episode's really done mm. is it hasn't said look this is where you should go this is where you shouldn't go it's painted a clear picture of a stark contrast between a, a winning market that is clearly on fire yeah. and a market that is as cold as it gets in the exact opposite direction and, and what they both look like from both a data landscape, from a political landscape, but things to really watch out for. And I think if there's one huge takeaway that I want everyone to get from this, it's, it's about looking at this yourself and thinking as an investor. Because Mike and I could sit here and give you a prediction and say, well, actually, because of our expertise and property investing skill, we believe X. Whilst predictions and forecasts are good, realistically that's all they are is predictions and forecasts they're not absolute the thing that's absolute is that this control over the next property you buy the maybe the first property you buy you could be at the absolute start of your portfolio that control is a hundred percent up to you that choice is a hundred percent up to you and it's up to you to look at these different markets whether you use a ba whether you, you go through a mortgage broker that's really you're building the team around you or whether you're doing this completely solo i hope you're building the team around you but either way you, you really want to make sure that you understand the difference between a winning market, a losing market, where it is. It's not always going to be there. Sometimes a winning will lose. Sometimes a losing will win. But this contrast between the two, I think, is really what this episode has illustrated and what I think you've illustrated very well in, in this, Mike. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of add to this episode as we're wrapping things up? That's one hell of a summary. I mean, that's a hard act to follow. I, I think I did it. Yeah, is it's like a, you and I having a punch up after the Conor McGregor and <laughs> Russian fella <laughs> fight. People are going to be very disappointed. But I completely agree with you. I mean, we're not saying, you know, Perth versus Melbourne as in like pick one. Like mm. we're just actually describing a market that is, you know, approaching its peak or at least is red hot mm. and a market that is very, very depressed. We're showing you the data points that support the fact that they're hot or they're cold. And I mean, it's objective truth. You can look at the core logic numbers and see, you know, on average, the whole market is up about 8%, whereas Melbourne is doing nothing and, and Perth is outperforming everything, right? But mm. what we're kind of saying is, we're not going to tell you where to buy. That's not what we do. But we're just telling you, look at the data and make the decision based on all of the fundamentals in full view of the facts. Because I think as property investors, there's so much data out there. You know, magazines, they're kind of gone in the property space, but that used to be all about buy here, buy this. This mm -hmm. is the place that grew 30%. Here are the top hotspots. And, you know, like even Terry himself sort of laments the hotspotting thing because he's really just trying to outperform the market, not find these sugar hit style markets where you can get in and out. You know, those are... Those are the mining style properties that grow mm. eighty percent and then they do nothing for fifty years, right? Mm. We're just kind of saying like don't get lost in the noise, look at the data, consider everything, and the the choice is a very, very important one because get it right and you're on your way to the financial freedom that got you involved in property investing in the first place. Get it wrong. You could be stuck with something that doesn't grow for a decade and we've seen that in the past. Personally, why I love Renault's in developing, like mm. it's, it's being able to force a bit of equity on it. So that way, even if you are wrong on the market pick, it's like at least you've got a bit of upside there, both in your, your equity gain and in your yield. But uh, that's another episode. That's it something is. different totally. Yeah. But Mike, what's an action step? Something that someone can pull the headphones out right now. They've been weighing up whether I should buy, buy in Melbourne, whether I should buy in Perth. What's something that they can pull the headphones out right now and put into action? Look, I think building the team as you referenced before and at the end of the day someone has to pull the trigger you have to make a decision and the best time to invest is really as soon as you're able to or yesterday right you can get lost in the analysis paralysis but if you do some diligent research or you engage an expert and you're tipping the odds in your favor i just thought of another analogy that i don't know if this fits or not mm -hmm. I, I keep trying to like pick things that i don't know much about yeah <laughs> I don't know why. But it I was reminds me of wedding dresses, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when I was racehorses, and I got mm. a friend of mine that invests in racehorses. He got like six of them. Mm. And I was talking to him the other day, and 
and he, he was basically saying how it all works. And I was just thinking like th this right now, I, I'm looking at the, the whole Perth and Melbourne side of things. And it's like, well, you've got the opportunity to buy the racehorse that has absolutely been killing it for a few years or the one that maybe ha hasn't done much, but it's come from a thoroughbred. It's got a great background, a great history, mm. but it's like it doesn't have the, the proof right now because the past few years, it's just been sitting in the paddock. It's just like been that. chilling out. I like that. And I don't, I don't know if that fits because, like I said, I'm not a horse guy. <laughs> yeah, but it's from, you know, a, distinguili a distinguished stable, right? Because you, that's th it. you think about the medians mm. and it's always been Sydney's the big dog and then Melbourne is second. Melbourne's yeah. now mid-pack, but Melbourne's from a premier stable. Yeah. It's still internationally attractive. People aren't leaving. It's getting... You know, it's not getting the number one lion's share of interstate uh, international migration, but it's on the podium. Mm. You know, it's perennially prop popular, but it's down and out. It's sad. It's the ugly duckling right now. Mm. And that's where I think there are opportunities for investors. And, and maybe that winning horse is going to keep winning for years. We, we don't know, but mm. maybe not. Yeah. And it's, it's the, the whole debate. It's the whole point of this episode. But Mike Mortlock... It's almost dinner time now, actually. Mm. And I have to ask you, arguably the most important question that I've asked you before, but I always forget what people say. I should start writing this down. Mike Mortlock, what is your favourite pizza? Horse. No. <laughs> oh, you Did know you say what? horse or horse? Yeah. Horse. Yeah. <laughs> the first time you asked me, I think I said fungi. And you're like, man, you're a weird bloke. And then I said... Uh, I should have said, oh, you're such a fun salmon. guy. Yeah, oh, missed opportunity. Funny, yeah. Missed okay. opportunity. Mm -hmm. And sorry. get your dad jerks in early. Oh, yeah, sorry. Smoked salmon. I interrupted you then. Yeah, I like smoked salmon. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the new favourite? Yeah, yeah. That's about where I'm at right now. But, you know, on a fungi base, you know, a little bit of, oh, you know what, you go to, there's a, a place that I won't mention on air, but they do like, you can do the little add-ons and they do like a truffle oil. Oh. Mention them. I'm, I'm always happy to give a shout out Crust. for a pizza place. Crust. Yeah. yeah they yeah. do like truffle oil as an add-on. Yeah, Joey loves crust as well. Um, Joe jo Tucker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they do like a gluten free base or something that's really good. Yeah, he gets okay. into his gluten free stuff. Does he? Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I don't actually think we even have crust in Adelaide. Right. Okay. Well, you've missed a trick there. Yeah, apparently. Mm. Anyway, Mike Mortlock from MCG Quantity Surveyors. Thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. I think that this is going to open up the way that people are looking at Melbourne and at Perth in a totally different light and hopefully help them make a, an educated decision that's right for them moving forward as property investors, mate. But um, it's something that you're absolutely going to want to seek a little bit extra advice around, but at least this will get you thinking along the right track. Mm. Mike Mortlock, thank you so much for jumping on the show. It's a pleasure. Happy investing.